for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. The glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. If eloquence I could display and every language sing, I have for thee. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. All praise to our God. Before the throne, we'll sing the song with saints from every. Everyone, uh, thank you so much for uh, joining in this morning. Um, it's a it's a great joy to be able to come in and speak um, some truth to you. Um, so, if you have a Bible, we're going to be in the book of Acts, chapter 17. Um, so, while you're turning there, um, I want to show you uh, something I brought. Um, if you know what this is, this is a football. Uh, in growing up, um, I played a lot of football um, at school, like during recess, I'm at church with some people there. Uh, in the neighborhood, on some teams, um, just love playing football. And a game that we, we used to play, and maybe you play something like this, and maybe you had a better um, name for the game than we did, but we play the game, tackle the person with the football. So if the natives didn't give it away, here's the rules. So we would all kind of stand like in a kind of a, a circle thing, and then we'd throw the football up, and then whoever got it would then run away from everyone else who tried to tackle them. And, you know, this was fun, like with a group of 15, 20 people. Um, and then, like, after, after um, about 15 minutes, we were kind of done. Um, we were either um, bloody or tired or a mixture of the two. And then there was, like, a few, like, of those, like, fast kids that, like, had all this energy that would continue to play until finally everyone else was done except for one. So that person would be the last one standing, um, the last uh, champion of tackle the person with the football. And I bring this up to help us introduce our talk for today. And our talk for today is entitled, The Gospel Stands. And what essentially that means is this, that among every worldview, every kind of community in the world, the gospel can stand. It, it has historical evidence, eyewitness accounts, et cetera, et cetera, to show that regardless of objections and doubts and um, arguments against Christianity, it can stand. So I want to give you a little roadmap of where we're going to be um, today. Uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 17. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to take a, a bird's eye view of Acts chapter 17. We're going to read some of the verses. We're going to explain some of the verses. And there's some that we're just going to summarize. Um, 
And then after that, we're, I'm going to give you three characteristics of God found in Acts chapter 17, verses 22 through 32. And then I'm going to give you three communities that sometimes we as Christians are scared to engage in conversations with um, that the gospel can stand in. And then I'm going to give you three application points um, of this gospel. So with that being said, let's dive right in. We've got a long way to go, so hold on and let's go. So um, Acts chapter 17 is Paul's um, journey through um, Greece, which is over in Europe. So this is part of Paul's second missionary journey of the three or four that he took during his lifetime. And so, um, looking at verses 1 through 3, here's where Paul is. After they passed through um, Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, a lot of big words, uh, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As usual, Paul went into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah. So what Paul would do when he goes go to these towns, he would find the Jewish synagogue, he would find the Jews, and he would reason with them in the scriptures that the Messiah that the Jews are waiting for is Jesus. Okay, so they would, he would go into these synagogues and, and do that. And so what would happen is um, here in Thessalonica, um, he would go talk to the Jews, and some of them would reject Judaism and then start following Christ because of Paul going into their place of worship and preaching the gospel. Um, a couple years ago, uh, some Jehovah's Witnesses came to my house, and for about a month or a month and a half, they would come every Friday, and we would open up um, the scriptures and talk about the differences that we had theologically and doctrinally about Jesus. And they started to invite me to come to their worship service on Thursday nights at 7 o'clock. And so for about a month and a half, I went. And I would sit with Sister Gray and her family, um, and I would listen to their service, listen to their, their elders and preachers preach from their translation of the Bible. And then afterwards, I would reason with them, um, question some of their teachings, and we would have this discussion back and forth until it got to the point where I was meeting with one of their elders um, in the church. And, it, and let's just say it didn't end very friendly, um, and I was asked not to come back. And for about two years now, I haven't, I haven't talked to a Jehovah's Witness uh, here in Jacksonville. Um, I haven't been to one of their services uh, in two years. So if you're looking for a kind way um, to uh, avoid Jehovah's Witnesses coming to your house anymore, go and join one of their services, open up scripture and reason with them um, about the differences that they have of Jesus versus what we have, and you will probably not see them um, again. Um, so that's what Paul did. He went to the synagogues and he um, reasoned with, with the Jews. And here at Thessalonica, something happened. These Jews got so upset because they thought Paul was blaspheming and, and criticizing the God that they believed in, and something else happened. Some of their Jewish friends that um, believed their traditions and did their rituals started getting saved and started trusting in Jesus. So they were rejecting those traditions and rejecting those rituals and becoming Christ followers. So there was a group of Jews here in Thessalonica that got really, really agitated. So they got together and became rioting. They started rioting in the city. And so what they did, they went and found the house that Paul and his friends were staying there with um, the, the head of the house name was Jason. So listen to verse uh, 6, chapter 17. It says this, When um, they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city officials. So they grabbed Jason out of his house, came to the city officials, and they wanted the city officials to punish Jason for housing Paul and his traveling companions. And so the the, the Officials like, what do, you, what do you want us to do? Why are you here? And here's what he says. It's really clear and clever. These men who have turned the world upside down have come here too. And so they're making the case, hey, these guys, Paul and Jason and these companions, they're preaching this Jesus and people's lives are being changed and literally the world is being changed. And so we're mad. We're mad that they're rejecting our traditions and the way our way of life and trusting Jesus. We want this to stop. Now I want you to just pause for a second. If you got in your car on a Sunday morning and you drove up to our building and you saw 500 people rioting in our front lawn of our church service and their signs are something like, we do not want you here. Take your Jesus and leave 
Jacksonville. Not because we're being hateful, not because we're being evil, but because we are preaching the gospel. And those people's friends and family members are rejecting their old way of life and they're trusting in Jesus and they're living this new life of rejecting their traditions and rituals and the way of life and, and following Jesus. Their friends don't like that. They see that like, no, we want the old Jimmy. We want the old Tom. We want the old Susan. We want the old one. We don't want this new one. So at BC Jacksonville, get out of town and take your Jesus with you. What a sight that would be if we as a church, as Christians, would be faithful to proclaim the gospel. We would see life change, and we might even see some people angry at that. But that is okay. That is okay because we see that our leader, Jesus, he was rejected. He was cast out. He was killed. And so we can expect that as well if we are faithful to preach the gospel. And that's what Paul experienced. So they release Jason, and uh, Jason goes back home, and he, and he finds Paul and says, Hey, for your safety, let's get you out of here. So Paul and his friend, friends go to the another Greek city of Berea. And there they go to the synagogues and the marketplaces, and they begin to reason with the Jews there. And these Jews were a lot more respectful of Paul. They would sit down with Paul, and they would open up the Scriptures together, and they would um, reason and ask questions and doubts and objections, and, and they would just do it very, very you know, respectfully. But then the people back at the Salonika caught wind that Paul was there. And so these agitators and these writers went from um, Thessalonica to Berea and began to... Um, riot there. And so Paul and his companions leave there and they go to the capital city of Athens. And that is where we're going to pick up um, here. And so what, what happens next is they arrive in Athens. And so as Paul is walking around, they he notices dozens and hundreds of idols that were made um, by stone or by wood or by gold or silver or some other type of metal. And there's, there's everywhere around Athens. They're covered um, over Athens. And now I, I know that when we go to a city here in America, you're probably not going to see thousands upon thousands of idols made from wood and stone, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what you will see is people who are filled with idols in their hearts. Stuff like money, stuff like pride and um, pornography and lust and greed and self and jealousy and anger. And there, there are there are idols in our lives that we have that many people can't see, like you can't see a wooden statue or a gold statue, but there are idols in our hearts. And so this, is, this here, Athens, represents America so, so well. And so Paul walks into Athens, and he sees all, and he is just depressed. He is sad. He is overwhelmed by the number of gods. These people in Athens were so religious that they even made a statue to represent any god that they might have missed. So over there, you might have the, the goddess of love. Over here, you might have the god of war. Over here, you might have the god of the moon, et cetera, et cetera. And they had so many different shrines. And so Paul sees this, and he is just hurt. And so he goes, and he begins to preach the gospel in the synagogues and in the marketplaces. And some, some particular people catch wind of this. And they're, they're, we can read about them in verse uh, 18 of chapter 17. It says this, Some of the Ep Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also debated with Paul. Some said, What is this ignorant show-off trying to say? What a kind of a, a slap in the face, an ignorant show-off. Um, others replied, He seems to be preaching of foreign deities because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. So these really kind of mindful uh, philosophers start debating with Paul and they call him a show-off because he's preaching this, this, this uh, foreign deity that they haven't heard of. So they go and they report to the Areopagus. Now the Areopagus is these really smart people at the time here in Athens. And they meet together on this place called Mars Hill. Um, and they like to hear new ideas. So they inquire of Paul, say, hey, Paul, you know, we hear you speak of this, this foreign deity that we haven't heard before. Come and present um, this message to us so we can hear it out of curiosity. So Paul makes his way up to the Mars Hill or in front of the Areopagus, and he begins to address them. And that's where we're going to pick up with our three characteristics of God. So I want to pause right here and say this, is that the gospel starts and ends with God for the glory of God, by the power of God. The gospel speaks of God, not of humans, but of God. The purpose of the gospel is to bring glory and honor to God through 
the salvation of people. And so we have to be reminded the gospel is all about God. So here are three characteristics that Paul brings up to the Areopagus as he's making the case for the gospel. The first is this, is that God is the uncreated creator and giver of all things. Look at verse 24. It says this, um, The God who made the world and everything in it, he is Lord of heaven and earth, and does not live in shrines made by hands, neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives everyone life and breath and all things. So do you remember earlier I talked about how the, the people in Athens had a statue made to the unknown God? Well, Paul used this and said, hey, this unknown God that you have here in your shrine, let me tell you about him. He is the uncreated creator of all things. All throughout the scriptures, um, anytime we talk about God, God is this idea of an infinite powerful, eternal being that has always existed and will always exist. In fact, nothing or no one is more powerful than God. There is no being greater than God. He is the greatest being and nothing can touch him, either create him or um, compare to him. He is uncreated and not only is he uncreated, but he created all things in the world, um, in the world and outside the world. So every star, every sun, every galaxy, every human, every blade of grass, every sea on this Every sea, every sand on the seashore, everything. He created everything. If you've never seen the movie Toy Story 1, 2, 3, or 4, it's about, a, uh, it's about what toys do when humans aren't around. And um, in the first one, we were introduced to some, some toys um, uh, that this kid named Andy has. Okay, And so what Andy does, Andy takes every toy that he has and he writes his name on them. And so we have the main character, which is Woody. He's a, he's a cowboy, and we have Buzz Lightyear. Year and he's an astronaut. And so what, he, what Andy does, he takes his toy and he writes Andy on the bottom of these things. And what this does is it separates that Woody from any other Woody in the world because it belongs to Andy. And it separates that Buzz um, from every other Buzz in the world because it belongs to that Andy. So when any human picks up Woody or Buzz or Mr. Potato Head or the dinosaur or Bo Peep or any of Andy's toys, they look at the bottom and it says Andy, they know it belongs to Andy. Well, in the same way, we can take any piece of grass, any star in the sky, any sand on the shore, and say, and it will read God, because He created all things. Not only did He create all things, but He sustains all things. He makes sure it works the way that it's supposed to work, and He gives us all things. The end of verse 25 says that He gives everyone life. So the life that you have was given to you by God. The breath that you breathe was given to you by God. And lastly, um, all things that you have was given to you by God. So that's the first way that God is described here in uh, Acts chapter 17. He is the uncreated creator and giver of all things. The second one is this, is that God is unknowingly knowable. That sounds like, a, like an oxymoron and a contradiction, but let me, let me explain it to you just real quickly. Verse 27 says this, He did this so that they might seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find Him, though He is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said. For we are also his offspring, since we are God's offspring then. We shouldn't think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image fashioned by human art and imagination. So let me start here in verse 29. God is so infinite, God is so unlimited, that our minds cannot literally grasp it. And so um, what these people were doing in Athens, they were taking like this idea of love or war, and they would kind of break it down into a um, carved image of gold or wood or et cetera so that they can explain, hey, this, this is the god of uh, war or this is the goddess of love. And they would try to break it down to a small figure that they can understand with their minds. And so what Paul is saying is, look, God is so infinite and holy and powerful and um, eternal that we cannot take his deity and bring it down to um, a, an image of gold or silver. Because he is so unknowable. There are things about God that we don't know, but at the same time, he wants us to know him. Verse 27, he did this so that they might seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find him. As I said earlier, he is the giver of all things. He wants to give us stuff. He gives us, he wants to give us breath and life and everything that we have. But the most important thing that God wants to give you and me is himself. 
And that is why, because he wants to be known, he wants to be found, he wants um, a relationship with you. And so even though he's really high up and supreme and intelligent and eternal, he, we can know him. We can have a personal relationship with him. So he is the uncreated creator and giver of all things. He is unknowingly knowable. And number three, God is righteous judge. Read verse 30 and 31. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent because he has set a day when he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he appointed. He has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. And this is talking about Jesus here. You see, 2,000 years ago, Jesus came into the world, put on flesh, and lived a perfect life. Now you thinking, why, why? Um, did Jesus need to come? Here's the reason why. Because God is holy and God is just. God cannot associate himself with unholy people. And you and I are unholy people because we have messed up against God. We have gone against God's standards. But when Jesus came, he lived perfectly according to God's standards. And so when he was put on a cross, a miracle happened. God put your sins and my sins, your wrongdoings and my wrongdoings, on Jesus and punish and kill and unleash his wrath on Jesus um, for the sake of your sins. And Jesus died, is buried, and rose again three days later. And when he rose again, uh, one of the things that Jesus said is this, that if you will turn from your sin and trust in him, your sins will be forgiven and you can be made righteousness through his work on the cross. And so what this is saying here is this, if you want to be confident and sure that on this day of judgment, when God stand, when you stand before God and give an account to your life and you want to spend eternity with Him, you have to be trusting in Jesus and God is going to want to be judging that. And so there hasn't been a time in your life where you have, you, have, you have not given your life to Jesus. Now is time. Why? Because in verse 30 it says, now is the time for everyone to repent or to turn from their sin and trust in Jesus, who's the only one who can give you righteousness, not your good works, not your good deeds, only Jesus. And so we see here that God is the righteous judge. He's going to judge you and judge me based off if we have a relationship with Jesus or not. That's the only, only way. So he's the uncreated creator and giver of all things. He is unknowingly knowable. He is a righteous judge. So I said earlier, I want to give you three communities that sometimes Christians struggle to engage in gospel conversations because maybe we're too scared of what um, these people might believe. The first community is this, is the governing community. You know, like um, people in authority, people, you know, in the state, uh, local and federal level. Like we're scared because like they're, they're smart and powerful. They, they won't listen to this gospel. These people here in this story, the Areopagus, these are big governing people. They are like the Supreme Court of Athens. They are smart people. And Paul is here testifying of the gospel. And we see from verse 34 that some of them believed. And so we can be confident when we are speaking with people who have authority, either at the local, state, federal, or world level, we can be confident that the gospel will stand. Uh, I read a book recently called Love Wins by uh, Bob Goff. And after 9-11, him and his kids sent letters to different world leaders around the world asking if they can be their friend and hear what their country needs, et cetera, et cetera. So some of these world leaders sent a letter back to these, these, this family and said, yeah, come on. And they brought them to different countries. And these world leaders got to meet with these kids and with, with, this, with this dad. And they began to exchange um, thoughts and ideas. And they became friends to the point where the Goths, gave these world leaders a key to their house and said, if you're ever in America, come and stay with us. And he implied that there have been some that have come. So we know that these people love them and probably share the gospel with them. And maybe some of them got saved. And so you can be confident when we go before authorities and, and before judges or before presidents, we, this gospel will stand. The second community is the religious community. Sometimes we're scared to share the gospel with other people from different religions. Well, here um, in America, people hate the word religions or religion. Like, I'm not religious. I'm, I'm a spiritualist or I'm an atheist or agnostic, et cetera, et cetera. I'm nothing. Um, but in Athens, they embrace this title. And so he is probably in front of a ton of different religious backgrounds. And again, we see that some of them believed. And so some of them probably rejected their religious beliefs and trusted in Jesus. And so um, here, in the, here in the quarantine time, I've been talking to people on an app called Reddit um, literally all over the world, some in Iraq, some in Germany, um, some in Canada, uh, all over the world. 
and they come from different religious backgrounds. And I've been talking to some Muslims recently, and uh, I was just shocked by they, they not knowing some of their basic beliefs um, as Muslims, but they, they have been listening to what I've been saying about Christianity, and they've been asking good questions and having good comments, and we've been having great conversations. And so we can be confident when we speak to, to Jews or to Muslims or to atheists or to um, Mormons, rebel witnesses, this gospel that we believe in will stand. So not only the governing community and the religious community, but also the scientific community. We can go boldly and courageously into people um, who are scientifically driven and preach this gospel, and it will stand. Um, here Paul quotes um, in, in verse um, 28 some of the well-known Greek philosophers at the time that people knew. And so he, was, he took this idea of, philosophers who had these really kind of deep thinking minds and use that to his advantage to preach the gospel. So we too can go to people who have a deep love and a deep passion for science and be able to share the gospel with them and they will respect it. And so we just have to go. We have to go to the governing community, the religious community, the scientific community, the community around us. So lastly, the three takeaways from the gospel. The first thing we got to do is we got to trust the gospel. If you're someone who's never Turn um, from your sins and trust in Jesus. Today is a day for you to turn from your sins and trust in Jesus, and you will experience salvation. You will experience one day being with God forever, forever in heaven um, with Him. And so if you have never trusted in Jesus, um, please call our church, 501-982-1519, 501-982-1519, and we would love to talk to you more about how you can give your life to Christ and how you can begin to follow Him today and immediately. Number two is this, we need to know the gospel. We need to know it, believers, inside and out. We need to be able to come up with different objections and different um, questions that people may have so that we can answer, answer their questions. Listen to this, verse 32. When they heard, talking about the Areopagus, about the resurrection of the dead, some began to ridicule him, but others said, we'd like to hear from you again about this. So when we share the gospel, people are going to have questions and doubts and objections, and we have to be prepared to reason with them and answer questions and walk them through this. And then this, verse 33, So Paul left their presence. However, some people joined him and believed, including Dionysus, the Areopagite, a woman named Damaris, and other, others with them. So Christians, we need to research, we need to read, we need to study, we need to know what we believe, why we believe it, and be able to defend it when people ask the questions. We do that lovingly, we do that with truth and boldness. So we need to trust the gospel, we need to know the gospel. And number three, we need to proclaim the gospel, not only in the governing community and the religious community, scientific community, but also the community that you are involved in. So a couple things to think through before we end our time together. Number one, have you turned from your sin and trusted in Jesus? Have you um, turned from your sin and trusted in Jesus? Um, as Christians, are you resting and the finished work of Jesus? Or are you constantly trying to gain the approval of God? Because you can't. The only way you gain approval of God is by trusting in the finished work of Jesus that he finished on the cross. So don't um, waste your life by trying to earn God's favor. You're not. You have to give up control and give your life to Christ and trust in the finished work of, of Christ that he did on the cross. The second thing is this. Believer, which community do you need to proclaim the gospel in? Do you have friends who are uh, in high power? Do you have friends who have a different beliefs than you do? Do you have friends that you know believe science more than they believe in God? Which ones? Is it, do you have a neighbor that you need to engage, come to engage them with the gospel with? And so I want to end our time together by asking you those questions to think about. And then don't just think about them. Don't just pray about them, but do something. Go knock on their door, send a text, send a phone call, and go engage conversations and be confident that this gospel will stand. So usually um, at this time in our service, we, um, we give. Um, the Bible tells us to give um, for the working of the Lord and for the working of His church um, to reach, us, to reach the, the nations with the gospel. Um, and so if you've given in the past, uh, we thank you so much for doing that. Continue to do that. Um, there are a couple different ways that you can do. You can give. Um, you can go online to our website at www.fbcgo.com, and there's a place for there for you can give online. Um, you can mail in your, your gift um, to our church. 
Um, or you can come by um, and we have a box out in front of the office where you can, you can drop off um, your, your giving there. Um, but thank you for giving. Uh, thank you for being faithful um, in giving um, as the Lord directs us to do that. So let me pray for you um, and uh, let me just encourage you just to um, be bold and be courageous when it comes to proclaiming the gospel like Paul did here uh, in front of the Areopagus. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful um, that you use people like me, people like the, the people who are listening to this, and, and normal people, and Paul, and, and Peter, and other people like that. And God, we are so thankful uh, that you use us to um, advance the gospel all over the world. And so, God, we just pray right now that you would just give us confidence, give us boldness, uh, give us a, a fervent uh, desire to share the gospel with those who need it. God, let us, let us go into the governing community. Let us go into the religious community. Let us go into the scientific community. Let us go into our community and um, bravely and courageously share the gospel. God, we pray for salvations. We pray for salvations here in Jacksonville, and we pray for salvations here around the world. And so, God, if there's anyone listening to this who doesn't know you, I pray that today they would know you and that they would trust in you for salvation. We thank you for this time together. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Hope you have a great week, and thank you for joining in, and we will see you soon.